There wasn't any shooting, but this ordinary shopping street has been the scene of a revolution, a social revolution caused by the war, which has changed the buying habits, and therefore the living habits, of the British people as drastically as bombs changed their towns. Pre-war, Great Britain imported two-thirds of the food it ate, and it ate pretty well. Mrs. Bill Green, an average British housewife, filled her market basket with her choice of foods brought from all over the world. She bought as much as she wanted of anything she could afford. But on that old system, the British could never have survived the war, so they cut down their food imports by half. They rationed all basic foods except bread and vegetables. They controlled prices strictly. It put the dollar a day man on an eating level with a dollar a year man. There are four in the Green family. Their basic rations don't amount to much, but they are sure of getting them every week. Two pounds of sugar, half a pound each week for everyone, half a pound of tea, two ounces each, half a pound of butter, half a pound of lard, and a pound of margarine. That is, two pounds of fats for the Green family, three ounces of cheese for each person, for cheese is an excellent meat substitute, a box of dried eggs from the United States, and finally, a full pound of bacon. Canned goods, what few there are, and spaghetti, breakfast food, and all that sort of thing, are rationed on the points system. And since all prices are controlled, housewives can afford the cost in money. It's the cost in points that's the problem. Threaded wheat, for example, is three points. The jar of jam is on the basic ration. When Mrs. Green has collected all her groceries, she has to start thinking about the meat ration. Meat is rationed by value, 23 cents worth for everybody each week. It works out at an average of a pound a week on each individual's plate. While Mrs. Green stands in line for her meat, Bill Green gets ready to take the 10.30 morning express to Birmingham. Because he works on the railway, Bill gets an extra tea allowance, for tea is as precious to British workers as coffee is to Americans. Bill must get along on odds and ends of meat substitutes in his sandwiches, but he doesn't grumble if he gets plenty of tea strong enough for a mouse to trot on. Helen Green, who was drafted to work in a tank factory, does a semi-skilled job of drilling for at least 48 hours a week. She eats her lunch in a factory canteen. Since the war began, 10,000 new canteens have been started, mostly in factories and schools. These canteens get extra allowances of food. Jimmy, the baby of the family, and his pal have had a good lunch at school, but Jimmy can never get enough candy to fill his sweet tooth. His ration, like everybody's, is only three ounces a week. He finished that days ago, but his chum is a hoarder. He has saved a whole month's ration. Saving has always seemed rather an anemic virtue to Jimmy, except at such moments as this. But maybe he can persuade his chum to do a little bartering. Uh-uh. Candy is worth more than a penknife in a swap. Back at the butcher's, Mrs. Green is lucky enough to get that roast she was hoping for as her family's meat ration for the week. Price, 92 cents. If they slice it thin enough, there may be some left for hash. Even though the rest of the family eat their lunches out, Mrs. Green finds that feeding them well when they're at home is no small job. Well, I do have to give a lot more thought to housekeeping problems than I did before the war. The rations have to be evened out over the week. That's no easy job. Take butter and margarine, for instance. 
We used to eat at one meal, what has to last us a week now. Before the war, I used to pride myself on my homemade cakes. But now, because of the fat ration, I can only bake them once a week. Then take sugar. We used to like our tea sweet and strong. But now, Dad and I take it without sugar, so that Jimmy can have enough for his breakfast cereals. And I have to keep a strict watch on the tea ration. If I didn't, Dad would be taking a can of hot water with him to work by the end of the week. All the time I have to be thinking about substitutes. Substitutes for meat, for milk, for eggs, and all the other things we used to have in plenty. And believe me, it's quite a problem. For Helen Green, the war's biggest riddle is how to keep pretty and decently dressed in the midst of luxury taxes and stringent clothes rationing. It's a waste of time now, walking into a shop and asking for your favorite brand of cosmetics. You just take what you can get. And as they're classed as luxury goods, the government slaps a 100% purchase tax on them. But the main headache is trying to figure out a wardrobe on 24 clothing coupons every six months. If I want a woolen frock, that takes 11 coupons, leaving me just enough for a pair of shoes and, say, a blouse. Mother takes the other two for towels. And of course, there's a purchase tax on clothes, too. My last winter coat costs twice as much as I'd have paid pre-war. But when every coupon counts, you can't afford to buy cheap stuff. All women's magazines offer hints, and women have used more ingenuity over their clothes than ever before. They simply have to, with only 24 coupons to spend every six months. That's one way of spending coupons. And here's another way. and mending and making things over. Women have managed to look neat and fresh on the outside, even if they sleep without nighties and cut down on lingerie. British families know that all these restrictions are necessary to victory, but even to father, they are irritating sometimes. Tobacco, beer, and all the other things that I consider necessities, they class as luxuries and are taxed accordingly. Take this tobacco, for instance. Costs me more than twice the pre-war price, and most of the extra goes on tax. The same with beer. That's gone up double too. And the strength's only half what it was. The restrictions on manufacture hits you in a hundred different ways. You might walk down the street, full of shops, with well-stocked windows. When you get inside, you find your favorite shaving creams out of stock. Or your size in shoes they haven't seen for a month. We've got to get a permit to buy furniture. And the book you want is out of print. We have to search for substitutes. But wherever you go, in every shop, you've got to pay a purchase tax on luxuries. It might be 60% on the original price or a hundred percent, but it puts a lot of things beyond our pocket. Jimmy? Yes, ma'am? It's time you bought another saving stamp. Have a bit of chocolate, ma'am. I thought you'd spent all your sweet coupons. You haven't been swapping, have you? Well, I've got five bars of chocolate and a bag of candy from Tommy. And what did you give him? My saving stamps. You must admit, Mother, that lease lends a wonderful arrangement. 